Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We brought up already a couple times uh, celebrating Veterans Day. It's a day of giving thanks. Uh, a very specific day for a very specific group of people. Uh, we give thanks to this specific group of people for what they have already done. Or perhaps in some cases what they are doing. Really, it's representative of a long line of people for what they have done. Now, of course, I need to point out those that are veterans, and I would like to invite for a second, just for those that have served, to uh, please stand up, that we may give thanks. I mean to point this out, of course, because as we do give thanks on Veterans Day, and uh, it is on Veterans Day, uh, right, this recognition that, that we appreciate for all that has happened and for the freedoms that we do enjoy uh, throughout this course of history that these long line of folks have done. Uh, marked this week by the freedom to gather for free elections with a peaceful transfer of power. Not that common a process throughout many countries across the globe. Free we are to do a great many things, right, because of the sacrifices that people have made, sacrifices of time, distance from family, the list goes on of things that folks have done. And so we thank them year after year, time and time again, we give thanks to those folks on Veterans Day. And it's that idea of giving thanks that is really the theme for our entire month, uh, as Pastor Josh mentioned last week, as we kicked off this month of giving thanks and looking at uh, the, the, the Apostles' Creed. Last week, he looked at the third article of the Creed, the section on um, the Holy Spirit, right? And we give thanks for what will be, right? We were reminded that the work of the Holy Spirit is to give us faith, that by clinging to the promises of God, by having faith in what he promises, we cling to that promise, especially last week we focused on the resurrection, Right? We, we were celebrating All Saints Day, reminding ourselves that it is not done, that we will see those who have gone in faith before us because we have been joined to Jesus in baptism, because we cling to that promise, the faith that the Spirit gives us. And so we look forward to that day when we will see everyone who has gone before us. A wonderful promise to help us in our grief when we have lost loved ones. Today it is the work of Jesus that we're especially thankful for. I'm going to invite you to turn uh, in your hymnals, as we did last week, to invite you to turn to page 322. Three hundred and twenty-two in the hymnal, right? We've already spoken the words of the second article, the, the section on Jesus, the second section, right? He said, and in Jesus Christ is only Son our Lord, and we listed the things that, that we believe about Jesus. I'll invite you to uh, to read with me the explanation. So after the what does this mean, there at the bottom right hand side of 322, what does this mean? Together we would read, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering in death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Now you can put that back up there, and I thank you for joining in that. That's that short explanation of what it is we believe about what Jesus has done, and it reminds me much of what we were giving thanks for today uh, on this Veterans Day, right? For the things that they have done, likely, likewise, we give thanks for what Jesus has done. Each and every day we give thanks to Jesus for what he, what he has done. And, and I bring up this distinction, I bring up what we talk about with Jesus because I want you to remember that we, first of all, give thanks to a Lord, our Lord and Savior, who is living, 
It is the living Lord. Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive and ascended, not dead anymore, right? We don't always think about this. We, we talk about the crucifixion, but we don't always get to the empty tomb. We don't always get to the fact that he rose and ascended up into the sky. The tomb is empty. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Right? That means he is our living Lord, okay? We worship a living God who has died and risen again, one who we know and confess will come again. What Pastor Josh pointed this to last week. He will come again to raise us all to eternal life. New, physical bodies, remade bodies, not burdened with the sins and the things that are broken that we experience now, not with the struggles that we have. We each know what that struggle is like, don't we? Whether it's seeing the brokenness that we have in our bodies from the daily aches and pains that we have, the suffering that we endure as our bodies decline, or whether we see the suffering and brokenness of our bodies as we think of loved ones who have died. That's why this happens, because of the sin that's present in the world, because of the brokenness that's there since the time of Adam and Eve. We were not made to have these broken bodies to have these short lives. But sin's presence in the world brought all of these troubles that we experience, from the mildest of conditions all the way to death, all a result of sin's presence in the world and the separation from God that it brings. God's good creation has been broken. This is what Jesus came to undo. The sin in our lives, the things that you confessed earlier, right? We go through the Ten Commandments, we take that moment of silence and we think about everything. I hope we think about something anyway. We think about the sin and what it has broken in this world. The broken creation, the separation from God. And in that sin and brokenness, Scripture defines us as dead. That we are dead in our sins, not living. And because of that deadness, I can no more do anything for myself. I can't do the good that God desires me to do, much less decide to follow him. Until we can't do any of those things until God does something first, and he did in Jesus. Jesus died. He took the death that you owed, every bit of sin that you were thinking of, every bit of sin that you didn't think of, every bit of sin that has happened all of time in history, Jesus pays the debt. The slate is clear, and that's the promise the Holy Spirit enables you to cling to. Thanks be to God. That's what we celebrate as we think of Jesus. That's what we give thanks for, what Jesus has done. And our psalm reading said it great today. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning. God's steadfast love, what does that mean? God's love for us is not like our love. The love we have for each other can rise and fall. People don't treat us right or, or they do treat us right and our love goes back and forth. But God's steadfast love is a faithful love in the midst of unfaithful treatment. In our sin, we turn away from him time and time again. I don't need you. I don't want you. I want what I want. But God in his love for us does not give as we deserve. He is, lo he is steadfast. He is is faithful. Our disobedience means Jesus and God, God altogether could turn just as easily, but he does not because of his steadfast love. That is the heart of the good news that we are called to share, that despite our sin, despite our unfaithfulness, despite your unfaithfulness, God still loves you. He still loves them Whoever the them is, there's been a lot of them talk this week following the election. Whoever that other side is that we're not happy with, right, and everybody's in some camp this week. Good news is God loves each and every one. And we are called to share with the others the good news. And there's two things key to sharing that good news. First is to see how remarkable it is that God does love you. 
to see your sin and to see the brokenness you have in this world and the fact that God still loves you despite that because you have tried your best in your sin to turn away from him, to run. In our own lives, we leave other people for much less than this, yet God in his faithfulness and steadfast love for you does not leave you. That is amazing. And when you can fully grasp that, that, that God loves you despite this, the horrible sin in your life, you are grateful. You're grateful for his love. And in that, in that gratefulness and the deep realization of God's love for you, it propels you, I hope, to go tell them, those others, whoever them is, that God loves them too. And calls you to tell them, not in an I'm better than you and, and this is what you should be doing, but to say, I'm broken too. I have struggled and he loves me still and he calls me by name to be his and that that is what he has done. That's what we give thanks for. That's what we rejoice and that is, he, that is what he has sent you to do. That this community of people, this broken people loved by God and Jesus cares for each other. We are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But we are sent because we are Easter people, because our risen Savior defeated death. Paul describes vast differences between groups of followers in that second reading today. He talks about those who have an abundance of joy and in their extreme poverty still gave. They were generous, not just giving back within their means, but beyond their means to care for the saints, that is, to the other believers. And that is part of our focus this month as we think about the thanksgiving we have. Part of it is how do we respond as good stewards of God's good gift to us? Because Paul goes further to exhort the believers in Corinth, those he was writing to today. As you excel in everything, in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, in your earnestness, and in your love, see that you excel in this act of grace. Notice what he's doing there. He is putting the generosity of believers on par with faith, with speech, and knowledge. To say that giving back is an essential part of our reaction in faith. I don't like to talk about it. It makes us uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable because it's the law confronting us. Because we don't respond. We keep it private. We want to hide that part of our faith life. Paul describes it, all of them as a response of faith for what Jesus has done. Yes, we love our neighbor. Yes, we have faith. Yes, we speak and share. And he says we give. Not so that one of us is more rich than the other, but to share the gifts so that none will be in need. So that others will know the love of God in Jesus. That's our purpose. To be lights in this community. To be filled with courage to help transform the community that he has placed us in. So that everyone has the same hope. So that everyone has the same comfort. So that everyone may give thanks for what Jesus has done for them. Just as you do. To that end, to those purposes of God, you are key. You're key in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, and your giving. May God grant you faith to respond to that grace of giving in all other aspects of your faith faith as you give thanks to God for what he has done in Jesus. In his name, amen.